Yeah, I'm gonna say something that's gonna be inflammatory to some people, so, and I almost hit it. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're talking about sleep deprivation, how I kept studying without sleep as a doctor by Next Gen MD. Let's see what he has to say. I'm somebody that just came off of about a two to two and a half month block of getting very little sleep, between two to five hours of sleep per night for an extended period of time as I was preparing for my step two CK exam for the USMLE. There will be times when you need to go two to five hours many nights in a row, but please try to avoid those times. If you can be intentional with your schedule and choose your rotations and choose when you take step two CK or step three or MCAT or whatever, so you don't have those times, you're gonna be a lot better for it. But unfortunately, you can't always get a good night's sleep, especially with the pre-med and medical culture that we have right now. It is often necessary, especially when you take into account the many responsibilities that all of us have when we're going through the process. Yeah, I'm gonna say something that's gonna be inflammatory to some people. So the pre-meds are gonna hate me when I say this and the messengers are gonna be like, yeah, he's got a point. You probably have more time to sleep than you realize. And don't use this reality that there are times in medical training when you cannot get your eight hours of sleep as an excuse to say, hey, I can never get eight hours of sleep. Because yes, you can most of the time, most nights, you can definitely get your seven to eight hours of sleep, especially when you're in college. When you get to med school and you have less control of your time, it becomes harder, especially during your clinical years, which third and fourth years, when you're on rotation, there are certain rotations that are gonna be insanely demanding. I remember I've had a week straight of 19 hour, I, was, I think it was like 17 to 20 hours every day for a full week. That was rough. There's no way I'm getting eight hours of sleep, seven hours of sleep each night, obviously. But most nights, you can get at least seven or eight, or at least six, right? This is not just something that's limited to people trying to get into medical school or doctors. Anyone that's trying to do something, to try and move from the position that they're at to something else, and to chase after a goal of theirs, will often come to the realization that sometimes it's just not enough hours in a day to get everything done. True, 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 but again, so I, I don't want to belabor this point, but I think it's very important to state that a lot of people will get more sleep, way more sleep than they currently do if they were much more intentional and disciplined with their time. So it is possible. You can't always just hack your schedule and create more hours in a day to get eight to 10 hours of sleep per day. So what we're gonna be doing today is taking a harm reduction approach. So I harm reduction, I like the sound of that. The so first thing that I do when I'm trying to go long periods of time without sleeping is to define what it is that I'm trying to do. That my goal is now more powerful than my body's physiologic need for sleep. Your body does not like to stay awake for long periods of time without sleep. You feel crummy. You can't move in the same way you want to do. Your energy is not there. You're a little bit more sad and depressed than normal. Your appetite kind of does weird things. Sometimes you're more hungry. Sometimes you're less hungry. And not just that, but your memory consolidation is also severely impaired and your cognitive performance. So if you're trying to do well in school and study and all those things, you're, you're taking a fat hit there. I knew that I was going to have to stay awake for long periods of time. So I told hundreds of people that I was going to be doing this. If I fail this exam, it would have been for a second time, that I was going to have to make a video on YouTube telling people that I failed again. In this sense, I defined my goal as such to keep myself accountable. And in doing so, in phrasing your goal as something that you need to do and not just something that you have to do uh, or want to do. And I did that when I was studying for the MCAT. I did that when I was in undergrad and I told my friends that, hey, I'm- So Gianluca is making a good point here. Like use a goal, use a vision, use your purpose to drive you when you're really, you're struggling, right? You're struggling to stay motivated and just remind yourself of that vision. I like that, however, I have a bit of hesitancy with this because if your body's like, hey, we need to sleep, and you're like, no, we're staying up and we're studying, again, your memory consolidation is really compromised. You're not gonna get that much done. You should actually probably not fight that urge to sleep too much. What I would suggest, and what I've actually done previously that worked really well for me, is use that intensity, that drive, that focus, and channel that not into trying to stay up later, but instead to being insanely disciplined and intentional with your time. Get rid of your TikTok, get rid of your Instagram, stop wasting time, and like, as soon as you wake up, what are you doing? Now, obviously you don't wanna do this for years and years, that's not sustainable, but if there's a season in your life, a few weeks, a few months, you're studying for the MCAT, you assembly step one, step two CK, et cetera, then you can channel that and be insanely intense for eight weeks, 10 weeks, whatever you need, and you'll get much better results that way, I feel. You wanna surround yourself with a circle of friends or colleagues that are like-minded to you and that will hold you accountable. That's so key. If you surround yourself with people doing the same thing, it becomes so much easier because what you're trying to do is the norm. It's not like everyone's here and you're trying to be up here. Everyone's already up here with you. So for you to fall down, they help pull you up as well and vice versa. Sense 
defining your goal and giving yourself a reason to push yourself through the next two months, three months. If you're serious about it, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a student, whatever the process is, you need a goal, you need a length of time, you need to tell people about it and you have to hold yourself accountable. The importance of exercise here for me is twofold. Multiple studies, science has reproduced time and time again that you feel better when you're exercising. Exercise in some length of time is better than exercise in no length of time, not doing anything. Agree with Gianluca here, of course, exercise is key. One thing to keep in mind though is use a reduced intensity if you're gonna be insanely sleep deprived. So I've gotten overtrained more than once and it's easier than you think, especially if you're going pretty intense at the gym because when you go to the gym, you put your headphones in, you listen to that really hype music and you just wanna push it and hit PRs or get as close as you can. And then if you're going home and sleeping four hours, then your body's not recovering enough and it's very quickly to burn out and overtrain if you're doing that. So if you are gonna be active while you're extremely sleep deprived, then reduce the intensity a little bit so that your recovery isn't as taxing. Being able to get into the gym, to go for a walk, almost counterbalances some of the negative side effects that you start to feel after going long periods of time without sleep. Going to the gym, going for a run, lifting some weights, actually helps, in my opinion, to help wake me up a little bit. For example, when I was studying, I would get to work, I'd work eight to five, and then when I got home, or eight to six in, in some cases, Afterwards, when I got home, I was so tired, but if I could push myself to get into the gym after a 45 minute or a one hour workout, I was a little bit more ready to go and do things afterwards. So key. So whether you're at the hospital or you're just studying really hard for the first part of the day, I did this for step one. I think I would study from what was it? Seven or eight until like three or four with of course some breaks in between and lunch and whatever. But after that, I'd be brain fried. So I'd go to the gym and then after that, I'd feel energized so that when I came back from my evening study block, then I was ready to go. Now, of course, the hard part is getting yourself to go to the gym. So then another trick that you can use is say, hey, I'm gonna go to the gym. I'm so tired. I don't wanna work out, but let me just go in for five minutes. And then you go for five minutes. At least that's what you tell yourself. And then when you start the workout, the five minutes pass and you're like, okay, I can keep going, this is not so bad. And then you get your 45 or 60 minute full workout in. Tip number three is the importance of strategic naps. If I found, for example, that I sat down to study and I just wasn't focused for whatever reason, I tried to work out and not even that was able to push me through, rather than struggling for three hours to try and just make it through a topic high level, I'd realize that my studying is no longer efficient. I'm gonna sit down, take a 45 minute nap, wake back up and then get back down to work. Really good point here, right? Which is if you feel like you're not making progress, you're sitting at this page and you just keep rereading the same page and nothing's sticking, don't try to force it. So whether taking a nap or going to do some necessary errand, maybe that's when you go for a workout or maybe that's when you go get your groceries or eat your food or whatever it is you need to do. So being attuned to how your body feels is actually really key. I try my best to get in as much sleep as possible on that weekend day. It doesn't actually get you out of your sleep deficit, but that's not what we're trying to do here. You're just trying to temporarily make yourself feel a little bit better so that you could push yourself through a little bit more studying, a little bit more hard work, a little bit more of whatever else you have going on until your next strategic nap break where you get to take in some sleep. I like to sleep somewhere between two and five hours per day. Some days it was closer to two or one and a half, but I always try to take at least a little bit of a nap. Then in my case, I found that I operate best with about two to five hours of sleep per day in some sort of breakup. If I'm gonna sleep an hour here, 45 minutes there. If you're gonna take naps and you have issues with grogginess when you wake up, that's because you nap for likely too long and now you're getting into deeper stages of sleep. And when you're awoken during those deeper stages of sleep and you haven't done a full cycle, your body's like, hey, what the hell, man? We're trying to get some nice R&R. &R. So what I found for myself is that a nap of 13 minutes in duration is ideal. And yes, I did a lot of experimentation to get to that where I feel I have enough time to have a large energy bump after that, I feel so much better, but it's not so long that I feel groggy. Now, when you go to 15, 20, 30 minutes, the risk of grogginess goes a lot higher and shorter than that, you don't really get much rejuvenation. So I do have a video on the Med School Insider channel talking about how to nap with intentionality to make sure you get all the benefits with minimizing the drawbacks. But napping is key when you're really sleep deprived. Tip number four is about the value of stimulants. And this one here, I, I really have- You don't need it! Because I remember more so in undergrad, to be honest, the pervasiveness of study drugs that existed around me. All right, me and my friends must've just been massive nerds because I never came across any study drugs ever in either college or in medical school or even in residency. There's other substances that are definitely going around, but the study drugs were not 
I don't think I ever came across them at all. I only heard about them for the first time in the news about students using it. And uh, even caffeine, I personally didn't, didn't use. I, I mean, I tried caffeine a couple times. I was like, oh, this doesn't sit well with my stomach, but you don't really need any of this stuff. And I mean, unless you're obviously prescribed it, then of course, follow your physician's uh, advice. I'm not your physician. This is not medical advice. But if you're someone who doesn't need a stimulant like Adderall, Ritalin, etc., but you think it's gonna give you an edge, don't do it, man. It's just a crutch. It's not gonna help you. Like, study the old fashioned way. You're gonna feel so much better about yourself. You're gonna build the skill sets that are necessary to serve you long term because medical training, lifelong learning. And if you rely on this crutch now, it's only gonna make things way harder in the future. Many of you that are going through the pre med and any sort of process right now, just know what people are doing to give themselves that little bit of an edge to stay awake for longer periods of time. I would strongly advise against it. Uh, this is one firm foot in the sand. Don't do that, period. <laughs> there is no additional thing I wanna tag on here. Uh, instead, I opt for typical black coffee is what I use. Myself, I've never really needed anything past traditional black coffee. Part of the reason I also stayed away from coffee is that one of my good friends that I studied with, he was anti-coffee and he's like, I just don't wanna get dependent on it because then I'm gonna have these withdrawal headaches and if I don't have it, then my performance is gonna be as elevated. And I was like, that's a good point. Like, I don't wanna get dependent on it either. So that's also partially the reason I avoided it. Coffee is also not healthy for you. And now I'm really dialing it back. Uh, I've been doing about a cup to a cup and a half per day. It's been working a lot better for me. If you're going to titrate up, just make sure that you titrate back down on the other side of the exam or whatever else you have going on. You can actually mitigate most of the downsides with chronic caffeine use by checking out this video where we're talking about caffeine cycling and all that good stuff. What do you do with the rest of your life if you're going long periods of time with sleeping minimal hours? and how do you function at work? How do I function in the hospital? Basically, if you are operating at a sleep deficit, you're exhausted, you're going to notice it in your regular work. You're going to have a little bit of brain fog. You're going to be a little bit slow in your reaction times. My advice here, number one, is to always stay busy. When everything was busy in the MRH, I really had no problems at all staying awake and staying moving. And it was really only during lulls, periods where there was nothing really going on, that I really felt like I was getting tired. On the other side of that, you are an actual safety concern when you are going long periods of time without sleep. Frequently, after I was done a shift, for example, if it was late at night, I would sleep for about 45 minutes. A couple times, actually, I had one of my buddies driving home from the hospital if I was really going that long without sleep. Dude, real talk. I had an instance where I think it was like a 32 hour shift roughly, and obviously no sleep. I get in my car, I go pick up some Thai food on the way back home, and in the parking lot, there's a stationary car behind me and I almost hit it. I stopped just in time, but because I'm just so out of it, it's hard for me to function and just like pay attention to my surroundings. So after that, I was like, I'm only going to be taking Ubers home if I ever do these crazy 30 plus hour shifts again. With regards to Next Gen MD's point about staying busy at work, I totally agree. I think that it makes it a lot easier when you're not having those lulls. When you have those lulls, you kind of need to push yourself and get that momentum going again. So if you're able to just keep the rhythm, and maintain that pace, it becomes a lot easier. So if you are, have, let's say you're on a rotation and you're having a lull in the shift, like get to the, get to the books and start studying. Keep that intensity and that pace at a decently high level. And then after the shift, then you can relax and unwind and recover a little bit before you ramp up again to study later that evening. This whole video is a harm reduction approach that I refuse to be a hypocrite. Every now and then you come across a point of time where you do, in my case, have to go and, and do things that are a little bit less healthy. Yeah, frequently in my career, there have been periods where I needed to do it to push myself and become a better person in the long run, both for my patients and for myself. Sometimes you have to do things that are very difficult and things that many people don't want to do, but if you recognize that you have to do them. And it's an unfortunate reality and it happens in a lot of industries, right? A lot of, a lot of careers, not just in medicine, but um, it is a matter of trying to minimize the frequency at which this happens. Like you do not need to be sleep deprived every single night when you're in as a pre-med or in, in med school. And even in residency, it depends on your rotation, of course, and your specialty. Secondly, when it does happen, try to, as Next Gen MD was saying, um, minimize the actual damage that's done. So I talk a lot more about that in this video up here. And the third thing is keep experimenting and find what works best for you because 
30 minute power nap may not be the best fit for you. And uh, on the other side of all this now, I am sleeping much, much better now. And I am loving it. I feel so much better now that I am getting regular night's sleep. So please, there's your plug for that. If you guys have any comments or suggestions or tips that work for you, or if you had a problem with me making this video, I, I, I feel like as time goes on, I am going to be making a few spicy videos like this and try and share tips. Um, because I think that spicy I videos. Imagine people so getting offended by a video about sleep deprivation. What have we come to? 2023. Nice MD. Great video. Thanks for making that. I don't think about sleep as often these days because I'm fortunate that with my current lifestyle, I'm able to sleep my seven to eight hours most nights. If I am sleep deprived, it's usually because I'm doing some crazy car reviews on my new car YouTube channel or something else I'm really excited about. So that makes me think that it might be a good time to do a five years later, you know, reflections and such on the differences in my current career and current career path versus um, if I had stayed in medicine. But anyways, guys, thanks so much for watching. If you wanna learn more about sleep, check out this video or that one. Much love, my friends, and I'll see you guys there.